As you guys have already figured out, English settlements varied considerably per region. In New England, the predominant belief of the settlers was that God ordained the family for human benefit. As a result, Puritans moved to the New World with their families. That would apply, of course, to pilgrims as well. The man was the head of the household, so it was a very patriarchal society. Women had a domestic sphere, but gender roles were not as rigid as you might think they were. A good book for you to read if you're interested in gender studies at all is Good Wives, Image and Reality in the Lives of Women in Northern New England by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. If you've ever seen that t-shirt or that coffee mug, it says, well-behaved women do not make history. That's a quote from this historian. In this monograph, Ulrich really explores what was a complex social dynamic between men and women. In her introduction, Ulrich notes, the position of a wife was complementary and at the same time secondary to that of her husband. What does that mean? When I see complementary, I think about that scene in the Tom Cruise movie where he tells Renee Zellweger, you complete me. When I think about secondary, is this behind, walking behind someone? Not number one, number two, is that less than? You complete me is romantic. You are less than me. Dude. Let's read some more and see if we can figure out exactly how men saw women or women saw themselves per Ulrich's research in this colonial time period. A married woman in early New England was simultaneously a housewife, a deputy husband, a consort, a mother, a mistress, a neighbor, and a Christian. On the war-torn frontier, she might also become a heroine. Of course, Ulrich then explains what she means by each of these terms, but she further tells us none of these roles existed in isolation. Each must be studied, not only in relation to the others, but within the detailed context of ordinary life in a particular place and time. Good wives is a study in role definition. A good question here would be, what type of information did Ulrich pull from the past that we can use to analyze how women were positioned. She takes various accounts, diaries, records from courts, uh, letters, anything that she can get her hands on, which is actually pretty hard when we're talking about women because they lived a more private life than men did to see how they saw themselves, as well as how other people perceived them. Some of Ulrich's findings were that, or are, that while women were primarily domestic in this colonial sphere, they exerted power in interesting ways. Through their husbands, to be sure, but as deputy husbands, sometimes, that would be one role that we could examine. To do that, let's think about the words deputy and husband. Husband is male, right? It's gendered male. If you become a deputy husband, some of the tasks that you are gonna perform are male-oriented. Now let's think about the word deputy. Typically, you've got a sheriff, and he has that sidekick, it's like Batman and Robin, and the sheriff is in charge, but the deputy is also important. The deputy is somewhat dependent on the sheriff, but as Ulrich says, one can be dependent without being either servile or helpless. I'm trying to think of a way that I can put this concept into the contemporary world in which we have some super fixed ideas about sex, which are strange since we also have all of these really fluid ideas about sex. 
let me try this one on for size. I don't care what your politics are. Think about your favorite first lady. Maybe that's Jill Biden. Maybe that's Melania Trump. Maybe that's Michelle Obama. Maybe that's Laura Bush. If it's before then, <laughs> then you are older than I think you are as my student, which could very well be true. But let's just stick with the 21st century. Whichever first lady here you might favor, all four of these women are smart, articulate, and accomplished outside of their marriages. Yet, why did so many people pay attention to what they had to say when they said it while their husbands were in the White House? You know the answer, right? Of course, if any of these women wanted to, they could run today for the presidency themselves. That makes this an imperfect analogy because the power dynamics aren't necessarily tied to their sex. It's just that we haven't yet had a female president and these first ladies are working a bit like deputy husbands might have worked. When Laura Bush or Michelle Obama or Melania Trump or Jill Biden went out onto the campaign trail, they were doing things. They were campaigning. They were acting in roles to advance those campaigns, to advance policy prescriptives that the administration approved of. They had power through their husbands. The first lady doesn't, she's not elected, but is she, is she less than her husband? I think that Laura Bush or Michelle Obama or Melania Trump or Jill Biden, they are worth as much and valued as much as their husbands. Heck, in fact, to be honest, first ladies are normally much more light than the presidents. The role of first lady is different from the role of president, but it is still a valuable role. And sometimes it has crossover with what the president is doing. As I said, first ladies are out there campaigning. They are performing a duty that is working in tandem with someone else, which does not make them less than, but does make them secondary, also complementary. Hmm. I, I, I'm getting the hang of it. I think, I think, I think I'm getting it. Do you, are you getting it? In the 1600s or the 1700s, when a woman was acting as her husband's surrogate, as a first lady can act like a president's surrogate today, she was advancing the interest of her family, which also advanced her interest. Like a 21st century first lady who is great at giving speeches and persuading people to vote for her husband, a wife from the 1600s or 1700s with a talent for business, quote, might become a kind of devil for her husband greatly extending his ability to handle affairs, end quote. That's what a deputy husband does. And unlike the sheriff, she doesn't get shot. If you didn't get that joke, it's Bob Marley, right? I shot the sheriff. I did not shoot the deputy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Here comes my sidekick. I shot the sheriff. I did not shoot the deputy. Getting back to the serious business of learning some history, all I'm really trying to do here is throw out some ideas from a historian about gender roles, how society and women functioned together uh, hundreds of years ago and have you think about, okay, well, in what ways has society changed? In what ways has it stayed the same? Does any of this look familiar to me? Can I relate to it at all? Does it 
even matter. I personally really appreciate this passage from Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's conclusion in this particular book. She writes, quote, the story of female experience in America is not to be found in a linear progression from darkness into light, from constricted to expanding opportunities, from negative to positive valuation or vice versa, but in a convoluted and sometimes tangled embroidery of loss and gain, accommodation and resistance. There can be no simple explanation of female status because that status is in itself so complex. To enlarge the role of deputy husband might mean to contract the often highly cherished roles of housekeeper and mother. To enhance the domestic might mean to neglect the communal. To control reproduction, to lose one's sexual nature, to abjure violence, to abandon the right to resist. Such changes were neither willfully imposed nor consciously chosen. They were part of much larger changes in the history of the Western world, yet they are best understood in the close exploration of the lives of ordinary women and men living in particular places and times." End quote. Anyway, good book, highly recommend it. I ask you to pay attention to what deputy husbands are in your learning objectives. And now I've explained it. Bye.